Hi, my name is Mike Yeager. I'm a pastor at Jesus of Lord Ministries International, and I come to you uh, today on this video. And the name of this video is, Why Did I Write Over 45 Books on Smith Wigglesworth? Why did I write over 45 books on Smith Wigglesworth? I, I, I know that sounds crazy, 45 books. And, and I'll, I'll get into the reason for that. Um, first of all, every one of these books are dealing with a different subject matter that Smith Wigglesworth taught on, he ministered on, he spoke about. And um, I'll, I'll show you some of these books. Like I said, if you go to uh, my Amazon account, you can find all of these books. Uh, actually, the Lord's allowed me to write over 175 books up to this time. Uh, over 120 of them are about my own personal life, which I'll talk about a little bit tonight. But f over 45 of these books are about Smith Wigglesworth. And uh, there's one book called There is a Miracle in Your Mouth. And that's where Smith deals with the subject of your mouth and the miracles that God will bring to pass when the word of God is in your mouth. Uh, another one is how to cast out devils. Uh, Smith Wigglesworth had tremendous success in casting out devils. Now, some of my books are actually Amazon bestsellers. Uh, one of my newer books is Smith Wigglesworth, Bold as a Lion, Perfect Love Casteth Out Fear. So this is a book I did called Bold as a Lion. And uh, all of these books were put together with the hope that it would help the readers to come into the same place where Smith himself walked. Now, uh, most likely, if you're watching this video, uh, you've already heard of Smith Wigglesworth. And he was a man uh, up into 1947 that was mightily used of God from the age of 48 years old. Now, actually, he began to be used of God before that, even as a little boy at eight years old. Now, I'm going to talk about the 10 major elements that was in Smith's life that made him a vessel meet for the master of Zeus. And I'm, I'm actually hoping to write a book on that subject, uh, How Come... God could use Smith Wigglesworth, who was just a plumber, uneducated man. He was not trained uh, in uh, uh, theology. He, he was not taught by men. Even as Paul said that when uh, he, he preached, it was not of men that he received the revelation, but from Jesus Christ himself. And that's what happened to Smith Wigglesworth, who was just a plumber who received divine revelation and downloads from heaven. There's another book I did about Smith called The Pursuit of Holiness. And Smith Wigglesworth was a man who lived a very holy, separated, consecrated life. There's another book I did called The Baptism of Fire, and God makes his ministers flames of fire. And uh, so uh, uh, Smith Wigglesworth, when he got baptized in the Holy Ghost at 48 years old, God filled him with fire. And God wants to fill you with fire, and he wants me to be full of the Holy Ghost and fire. And, and one important you'll think you'll discover about Smith Wigglesworth is he uh, was extremely hungry for God even before he got born again at eight years old in the Methodist church that his grandma took him to. And so this hunger for God, I, I've told our congregations, I've been pastoring since 1977, and the churches I have pastored, and God's allowed me to start, hey, I've always told them, if you lose your hunger for God, you have lost everything. And so I've got a book called Hungering and Thirsting After God from Smith Wigglesworth. And, and then I've got a book which we really want to zero in on tonight, A Man of One Book. And I believe that as you listen to this message on this video, you're going to discover that a major, major, major key in Smith's life was the fact that he only read the Bible. That's it. Uh, he quit school at third grade. I mean, actually, when he, well, I'm not sure if he even made it to third grade, uh, that his family was so poverty stricken and his father's heart was broken, but uh, him and, and, and his family members had to work in order just to have food in the house 
and a roof over their head. So in those days, there was no laws against children working in factories. And so Smith, he, he did not get an opportunity to get educated. And actually, until he met Polly, his wife-to-be, who was a preacher, for a fiery preacher for the Salvation Army, and she literally taught him how to read. Now, he could read a little bit, but not much. But Polly, his wife, and he married her when he was 23 years old, taught him how to read the Bible. And that's all he ever read. He never read anything else. You know, today we talk about the fake news. And there's a true story of Dr. Lester Sumrall, who is just a young boy preacher. I think it was 18 or 19. And uh, he was traveling the world. And actually, I knew Lester Sumrall. He actually had spoke in this church I pastor in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. And I was ordained through Lester Sumrall. And actually, I had been on his TV networks and his satellite networks uh, almost 40 years ago. But Lester tells the story of where he went to Smith's house to visit him, and he had a newspaper uh, under his arm, and Smith Wigglesworth would not let him into the house, and he said this. He said, you're not bringing that fake news into my house. Now listen to this. I'm going to show you why God could use Smith in such an amazing way. Now I'm just making some comments here, and I'll repeat myself a little bit later on. But I'm amazed at how many of us have to some extent really looked at the ministry of Smith Wigglesworth, uh, read a lot of the, the books written about him. He himself never wrote any books. Matter of fact, everything I've written about Smith came from an accumulation of through the years of gathering articles, uh, 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 per periodicals, uh, and writings where he would be in a meeting and people would transcribe them and put them in their magazines or in their writings or even in their books. And so all the stories in my books, 95% of them are right from the mouth of Smith Wigglesworth. Now, I'll say on top of this right away, uh, sometimes people will uh, go to my YouTube channel or my Facebook, my social media, and they will viciously attack Smith Wigglesworth because of the violent acts that he perpetrated trying to get people healed or getting people healed. I want you to know that in all my study and research of Smith Wigglesworth, since I first heard of him, and, and that's probably been over 40 years ago, um, he never said he did those things. They, they got one time where they got Smith taking a little baby and kicking it like a football out into the audience. He never did that in his stories. Uh, there was nothing. Now, I'm not saying he never got violent with the devil. He did, but not near as extreme as what people would have you to believe. And so them are just stories. Now, some people, they share these stories, and they think, whoa, wow, listen what Smith did. No, Smith never did that stuff. And so I just want you to know that. You've got to really check the source of where the story came from. And I really believe that the enemy does this in order to discredit a man, who truly knew God and walked with God. But he was a man of one book. And, and then one of my newest books, I, I just felt it needed to be written because Smith Wigglesworth in his writings, and I actually have a master uh, uh, document of everything that I could find that Smith himself said and some eyewitnesses, and it's called Overcoming the Spirit of Unbelief and Doubt. Overcoming the Spirit of Unbelief and Doubt. So there's a link um, at the bottom of this uh, description of this video, you can click on that link. And actually, uh, a lot of Smith's books, I, I offer them for free as Kindles and e-books as Amazon allows me to. Now, why did I write 45 books on Smith Wigglesworth? First of all, let me tell you that Smith is not in any way, form, or fashion my hero. I'm not involved in idolatry. I'm not involved in exalting a natural man. Uh, I only have one hero, and that is Jesus Christ. In all of my walk with God since I was 19 years old, my hero is Jesus Christ. I've known some very well-known men. Like I said, I knew Lester Summerall. Um, I had personally worked for Kenneth E. Hagan, been to his house, never really spoke to him. Uh, I've been around some very well-known men, and I highly respect them. 
Uh, I've known a good handful of men that were well known and totally backslid. And uh, I know even during the years that Swigert fell and Jim Baker fell and, and Larry Lee fell and Bob Tilton fell and I knew Bob Tilton. Let me tell you something. I, my heart wept for them. I never backslid for one iota. Why? Because they were never, never my heroes. And so don't ever exalt anybody above Jesus Christ. Now, Smith was born on the 8th of June, 19, 1859, and he went home to be with the Lord on 12th of March, 1947. He was 88 years old when he uh, gave up the ghost and went home to be with the Lord. The, the story says is that he uh, was talking to some people, and um, they were bragging about him, and uh, with tears in his eyes, he said, I have failed God. They're, all they're doing is talking about Smith Wigglesworth. The Lord is going to have to take me home. I, I don't really believe that. I don't believe he failed God at all. People always want to exalt man. They always want to lift up man. Well, aren't you doing that, Pastor Mike, by writing over 45 books about Smith? No, I'm, I'm going to show you what I, what, why I did it. And, and it's for your spiritual growth and edification to help you and I get to that place where Smith Wigglesworth walked and God used him in such a mighty way. And so when he was at a, fan, a friend's funeral, he was in the vestibule of the church, and as he's standing out there in the vestibule, somebody said it was like he just took off his coat and hung it up. He was gone. Off to glory he went to be with Polly, his wife. Um, now, I hope this video is going to produce within you a, a, a tremendous hope and understanding that God is not a respecter of people, that where Smith Wigglesworth walked, you and I can walk. Now, you might say, what right do you have to write all of these books about Smith Wigglesworth? Have you ever experienced these supernatural encounters like Smith Wigglesworth did in your walk with God? And, and I am not bragging, I am not boasting, I am not exalting Mike Yeager, but yes, I have. Uh, I've experienced things that Smith Wigglesworth never experienced, and he experienced things I never experienced. And you that are watching, you could experience things that I would never experience. But remember, God is not a respecter of people. Now, at the end of this message, I'm going to share with you some of the experiences I've had, not in detail. You can go to my Amazon account, and you can, like I said, there's over 100 books I have written that are filled with amazing encounters. I actually, uh, uh, up to this moment, and not, that's not all the healings, not all the deliverances, because every time we preach, every time we minister, you know, God shows up every time. And I've been ministering since I was a 19-year-old kid at this time in 65, and I, I've seen God do astounding things. And, and up to this time, I, I have written down uh, over 2,000 experiences that I've had with God. And uh, so now over the years, I have collected messages about Smith. And on top of that, I have read many stories of the saints of old and studied their lives, like St. Augustine, John Wesley, George Whitfield. Now, a lot of people don't understand John Wesley and George Whitfield during, and you go, if you go back to the Great Awakenings and the Brush Harbor meetings, uh, it, it, supernatural things were happening. I mean, just amazing things. John Wesley would tell the people, now, when I begin to speak, uh, I don't know why, don't climb up into the trees. He couldn't get into churches, so he'd, he'd be on the side of a, of a steep hill, and they would come up by the tens and twenties and fifties of thousands. And here's the amazing thing. He didn't have a PA system, but they, they say everybody could hear clearly what he said. That was supernatural. And he would tell the people, don't climb up into the trees, because when I start to preach, something's going to happen, and you're going to fall down like dead men. They said after one meeting, the ground looked like it was a slaughter field. Thousands of people laid out under the power of God, having visions of hell and heaven in John Wesley's uh, 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 gatherings. So George Whitfield, Father Nash, which traveled before, and actually I wrote a book. It's a very popular book on Amazon. Uh, Father Nash, the intercessor, who went before Charles Finney. Charles Finney was a man who was mightily used of God. 
uh, convictions, revivals, repentance, just awesome move of God. George Mueller, you know who, who he was. He's the one who started all those children homes in Great Britain with no money. Uh, tremendous man of faith, Alexander Dowie, uh, uh, who, who, came, who came over from Australia and, and built a town called Zion City outside of Chicago and had a tremendous impact in the late 1800s, not early 1900s, even upon John Wesley and, and the Bosworth brothers and John G. Lake and these people. And he, tremendous healings and miracles. Uh, and so there's Murdworth Edder, there's Reese Howe and, and, and others. Uh, and, and so, um, I, 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 but God didn't lay it upon my heart to write books about these people except for Father Nash. Um, now, let me just give you a little information about Wigglesworth. He was born in 1859 in Yorkshire, England, to a very poor family. And he later trained to be a plumber and married Polly Featherstone in 1882 when he was 23 years old. Um, when Wigglesworth married Polly Featherstone on 4th of December 1982, he did it at St. Peter's Church in Bradford. At the time of their marriage, she was a preacher with the Salvation Army and had come to the attention of General William Booth. Now, you know who John, and I've read the stories of General William Booth, mighty, powerful man of God who started the Salvation Army. And I'm telling you, many, many thousands were swept in. And of course, uh, you know, the Salvation Army still exists. But it's not along the same line as it was when William Booth started it. Now, when Smith was a little boy at eight years old, he, had a, uh, he got gloriously born again. And uh, Wigglesworth learned to read after he married Polly. She taught him to read the Bible. He often stated that the Bible was the only book he ever read. And did not, he did not permit newspapers in his home. The Bible was their only reading material. Now remember, he called newspapers the fake news. He said the only thing, now, and, and this is so important, don't let this go in one ear, not another. The only thing allowed in my house is the truth. Oh, I wish to God I would have had that kind of commitment with my family. I mean, there's been times when it was nothing but the truth in my home, nothing but the truth in my life. And I believe that's the reason why I've experienced so many encounters with God, so many miracles, so many times he's protected and led and guided and provided and, and spoke to us and saved us and rescued us because the word of God was in my heart. David said, I've hid your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Oh, but to God, I would have had this attitude. And I wish that many others like Smith had this attitude, that they're not going to let the fake news. And I'm sorry to tell you, that current event preaching is fake news. Uh, political preaching is fake news. Why? Because it's filled with information that we have gleaned and gathered from the world. And Jesus said, Jesus said, Jesus said, you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. We're going to look at the fact that Smith Wigglesworth, he had made a commitment in his heart that all he was going to do is put the word of God in his heart. It, that's it, nothing else, nothing else, nothing else. Now, he, he'd be at seminars and he'd be at conferences and he would hear preachers preach. But my attitude with our congregation is we've decided that all we want to do is listen to ministers that are going to make us more like Jesus. I want to become more like Jesus. I mean, that we might be transformed into his likeness and his image. And every man that has his hope purifies himself even as he is pure. And so he caught everything but the Bible fake news. Now, he was born again at eight years old and had a passion for souls. He never truly was a preacher until he was baptized in the Holy Ghost because he had a terrible speech impediment like his mother. He had the habit of repeating the same words up to ten times over before he could say what he wanted to say. Uh, the amazing thing is, though, during those years, Smith did speak at times. And uh, he actually was considered like a weeping prophet. Uh, they would have salvation meetings. And even though they knew that Smith could not really speak or preach, uh, they'd ask him to testify because Smith was so full of compassion for the lost that he'd just begin to weep and cry. And when he gave the order call, many, many would respond. But Wigglesworth's life changed dramatically when at the age of 48, he was baptized in the Holy Spirit and he was anointed with the power for preaching and healing. 
uh, he spoke in tongues for the very first time in 1907. Now remember, he died in 1947. So from the time he was 48 years old, and for the next 40 years, he, he was Pentecostal. Up to that time, he was not Pentecostal. For the next 40 years, Smith lived in a supernatural place where most believers will never live. It was like he was living in the book of Acts all over again. Now, the purpose of, of this particular presentation is, um, as we go through this information, is my hope really is that you would get a glimpse of, uh, of, of walking in this realm where all things are possible. Could you say that? Where all things are possible. So now I want to just share with you very briefly 10 major reasons God used Smith Wigglesworth. I've already spoke some of them, but number one, Smith always had a hunger for God, even as a little boy. He never lost his hunger. Now, if you don't have a hunger for God, you've got to develop it. You know, before I got born again, up until I was 19 years old, I, I was addicted to drugs and alcohol, chewing tobacco, smoking tobacco, rock music, all, uh, uh, all, all kinds of, you know, tequila and, and ripple wine and all kinds of filth. Uh, you know what? That wasn't automatic. I had to develop a hunger. You can develop a hunger for God, and you've got to. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. You've got to develop a hunger for God. So that's number one. Number two, uh, prayer in intimacy with God. Smith Wigglesworth, from the time he gave his heart to Christ at eight years old, he was continually praying. Somebody asked him one time, how, how, what's the longest you ever prayed? Now, I don't know if this is true. This is just... This isn't something I have been able to verify. He said, I've never prayed longer than 15 minutes, but I've never gone 15 minutes without praying. For in other words, his heart was filled with continual prayer. He was in fellowship with God all the time. Now, I know actually that statement is not true because in many of his stories, he'd run into situations that look completely hopeless uh, where people could not be healed. Everybody had given up. And he'd many times be up all night crying out to God until faith would explode in his heart and he knew what it was done. See, a lot of times I believe we pray too quick. We haven't been in that place of prayer. Remember, Jesus would go up into the mountains alone all night long at times and pray. Uh, there used to be a lot of times, matter of fact, Smith talks many times at all night prayer meetings. And it was normal in those days. I, I, I don't know where it is anymore. Most people can't even pray an hour. Why not, Pastor Mike? Because they, they don't have faith. They really don't believe that God hears their prayers. But the Bible says the eyes of the Lord over the righteous and his ears open to their prayers. Uh, uh, but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. And so prayer was a very important part in his life. And every day he prayed up until the day he died. Number three, he had a passion for souls, a never-ending desire to win people to Jesus his whole life as a Christian. Where is that today? Where is this passion for souls? Uh, people who die without loving, following, obeying, and serving Christ are going to a place of eternal darkness and uh, torment, uh, where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth, and where the worm never dies. You mean hell, Pastor? Yes, hell. I don't believe in hell. Well, you got a problem. I don't have a problem. If we don't believe, God can't deny himself. Uh, God said Jesus taught more on the subject of hell than anything else. So he had a real passion for souls all through his life. Number four, this here it is. He was a man of one book. Oh, to God, take a hold of this tonight. Um, I've got a video out called Enough is Enough. I just preached it last week. And uh, it's when fi God finally, I, 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 I went through a time of sickness started about four weeks ago and during that time i just began to cry out to god and i said god what's wrong with me and he told me he said son what's going on is uh you you you're 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 double-minded um you're not committed you're not dedicated like you've been at times he said uh because you are partaking of foolish stuff vanity uh you're filling your mind i'm talking about with even listening to preachers who are not taking you into the truth. And you will know the truth. And I repented. I did. I repented. And I said, Lord, I'm 65 years old. Now, if you would tarry, I, I, I might have another 40 years, another, even if I only have 23 more years, 
like Smith lived till he was 88. That's not very many years. And, and so I truly, with all of my heart, I truly repented. And I truly came out of everything. And all I do from morning to night, all night long, is meditate on the Bible and pray the Bible and speak the Bible and think the Bible. And, 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 and that's why I'm making this video today because I want to help you. And I'm believing that that's where the church has got to come to. That's where the bride's got to come to, to where all we're doing is the word of God. And so that's so major important. And I believe that when Smith, who had hid the word of God in his heart as much as he could, and to Polly taught him to read. And so from 23, actually Polly taught him how to read before he married her. So let's say from uh, 20 years old up into 48, all he had been doing, you know, is reading the Bible. So you got 28 years there. So when he finally got baptized in the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God took those incorruptible seeds of the Word and caused them to explode in his heart. So that's number four. Number five, he was a doer of God's Word. He, all, all of his life, it says, but be doers of the Word and not hearers only deceiving your own self. He did the Word of God. If you read uh, the, the life of Smith Wigglesworth, you'll find out that even as a little boy, he was feeding the orphans on the docks. Um, he was feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, visiting the sick, ministering and sharing the truth, even when he could not communicate very well because of his speech impediment, but he still kept on speaking the word as much as he could. And, and this is even before he was baptized in the Holy Ghost, speaking in tongues. Uh, so number six, he, he was a man of tremendous faith and integrity. Now, like I said, he really didn't have a lot of revelation of divine healing until after he was baptized in the Holy Ghost speaking in tongues. But then God gave him, see, all of that word, all of that word, all of that word. Plus, it's like having a garden. You got all the seed is laying dormant in the ground, but there's no weeds in the garden. And all of a sudden, a wonderful rain comes and the heat of the sun comes and, the, and, and it just springs up and you have an amazing harvest. And that's what happened to Smith Wigglesworth. There was not very many weeds in his garden you know he went through a process of sanctification he went through a process of purification he actually said that he had a that God had to break him a thousand times before he could come to the place where he could be useful to God and, and to the degree that God wanted to use him uh, so that's number six he, was, he was six he was a man of faith and integrity number seven he ne listen to this this is so important people listen to me he never allowed covetousness to take a hold of his heart. He never, you know what, uh, from the moment he got baptized in the Holy Ghost, actually, I think that the very first house that Smith and Polly bought is the same house he lived in until the day he died. Are you telling me I can't sell my house and buy a different one? No, I'm just telling you that Smith Wigglesworth said when it comes to money, you, you got to have a proper perspective that money is there not for your pleasure, not for your enjoyment, not for you to lavish uh, material things on yourself, but it's there to take care of the needy, the hurting, the lost, the, the sick, the widows, the orphans, and to spread the gospel. That's what it's there for, is to be used to spread the gospel. Now, you wouldn't know that today with many ministers' lifestyle. And I will say this in love. They will never live where Smith Wigglesworth lived. Covetousness is called idolatry. I'm writing a book right now called Beware the Mammonites. And I want you to know that Smith said that he was very, very careful when it came to money because he did not want to grieve the Holy Ghost and he did not want, he, he, he didn't want to sell his inheritance for a bowl of porridge. Now, I listened to a friend of mine last night, and he was ministering about Alexander Dowie, who was a mighty man of God, used God wonderfully. But guess what happened to him? Materialism got a hold of him. He got to thinking he was Elijah. And in a very short time, from 1901, when he declared he was Elijah, which he was not, he died in 1907, a very broken man. I've seen covetousness. People justify materialism. 
I'm not saying you got to live the life of a pauper, but Paul said, I know how to be full and I know how to be abound. I know how to suffer need and I know how to enjoy all things. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. For in other words, we have money, but it don't have us. You can't serve God and mammon. You'll uh, love the one and despise the other when you hold to the one and reject the other. You got to choose God or money. And I don't care about money. God meets my needs. I, I'm not, I, there's been times, many times when my wife and I were homeless. When we got married, we slept in the back of my pickup truck, slept in a, in a, in, in a tent to go down to Rainbow Bible Training Center. And God never begged. God took care of us. Uh, Europe, we slept in a bathtub for a while. I mean, wherever. I mean, we, we just, you know, got back to America and we had an old school bus that I converted and used the benches and then to make beds out of them. My wife never complained. I mean, we lived uh, not too long ago in a, a facility I built. It was an old dome, and it was leaking terribly. It needed new shingles 15 years before that. And I'm telling you what, it was just one day we're sitting at the dining room table, and the whole ceiling fell in on top of all of our food. Well, guess what? We just laughed about it and say, thank God we still have a roof over our head. So you, you, that's one thing about Smith. He never allowed himself to get caught up in covetousness. Uh, I'm not picking on jewelry. I, I don't have nothing. Um, Smith Wigglesworth, never. Gold bracelets, gold watches. They had them in the 1920s, 1930s, 1910s, you know. Um, but he never did it. He, he, he dressed good. He dressed with a respectable suit on because he said, I'm an ambassador of Jesus and I need to represent him. So he never allowed covetousness to come in. Number eight, he was a Holy Ghost man through and through. Uh, he was very sensitive to the moving of the spirit. I'm sorry to say most men in the pulpit today have no ideal. Uh, uh, they can't discern the voice of the Holy Ghost. You know, they got their program all laid out. They got their uh, clock set at a certain time. And they got to be uh, busy about the program. Well, Smith, he, he strived to hear God in all that he did. And this is it. It says, and, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sitting unto the redemption. And uh, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind one to another, tender heart, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. And be not drunk with wine when it's excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourself in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing, and make melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourself one to another, fear of God. And of course, it goes on about wives, submit to your husbands and Wives love uh, your wives. Uh, husbands love your wives even as Christ loved the church. And believe it or not, that all has a part with being full of the Holy Ghost. If you want to be under the power, the influence, and the control of the Holy Ghost, there is a price to pay. So that's number eight. He was a Holy Ghost man. Number nine, oh, did Smith love God. My, oh, my, did he love God. He could not get enough of God, and he loved him with all of his heart until the last day he died. It, it could be said like David of old, Whom have I in heaven but thee? There is none on earth I desire besides thee. And, and in the very first commandment, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, strength, and being, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. This is the very foundation of ministry. Yeah, the very foundation is a passion, a love, for the one who bought you, who died for you, who took your sins, he took your sicknesses upon the whipping post, who, 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 who on the cross uh, uh, cried out, said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, who gave up the ghost and rose again. In Timothy, it says, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness, for God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on the world, and received up in the glory. Now, remember, I said Smith was a man of one book. And like I said, I've written over 45 books about him. I'm probably not done. But let me tell you, in all of my reading of what Smith taught and said and what he declared, I'm telling you what, out of everybody I have ever read and even with the teachings I have received uh, and, and the education I went through in order to get a Ph.D. and a doctorate of divinity, let me tell you something. There is nobody I have read outside of the Bible that that, that came as close doctrinally to what the Bible says. 
Smith just simply believed and agreed with the Bible. He didn't argue with it. He, he didn't add to it. He didn't take away. Now, I'm not exhorting the man. He was just a plumber. And, and this is why I wrote, instead of writing about these other men, I love Smith because he was just simply a plumber. Some people say, oh, he was an apostle of faith. He was this, he was that. He never said it. Smith never once said he was, he was an apostle, a prophet, an evangelist, a pastor, or a teacher. Now, his wife, his wife was a pastor, and uh, for many years, she's the one who ministered uh, in, in their Bradford mission, but he didn't speak until he got filled with the Holy Ghost. Then he began to speak on a regular basis. But Smith never claimed to be fivefold ministry gifts. So this is why I wrote about Smith. Listen to me. Those of you who are taking the time to watch this video, get excited. You, you can be used mightily of God without being an apostle, a prophet, evangelist, pastor, or teacher. And matter of fact, those ministry gifts are given for, to, to, to help the saints to come to a place for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come into the unity of the faith, of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So number 10, listen, Smith was faithful in whatever God gave him to do because he had a servant's heart. It was never about Smith Wigglesworth. It was all about Jesus. It was all about serving people. It was all about helping people. It was all about getting people saved, healed, filled with the Spirit, and set free. And, um, and, and so this is, this is why I've written all of these books about Smith Wigglesworth. And I, like I said, I believe what happened to Smith happened because he hid the Word of God in his heart. He was reading it. He was meditating on it. He was speaking it over his life. And when he finally got baptized in the Holy Ghost, I'm telling you, the Holy Ghost came upon him in a mighty, mighty way. Um, now, uh, remember Smith, the only book he ever read, and I'm going to talk a little bit about my life in a minute. There has been many times in the last four or five years since I was a 19-year-old kid that I have done exactly the same thing that Smith Wigglesworth did. All I did was give myself to nothing but the Bible, nothing but the Bible. Now, I, I, I've looked for others, and I'm sure others have made that commitment, but I, I personally don't know anybody. Uh, I've even searched YouTube. If you know people who have made this commitment, ministers, please, I'd like to connect to them. I really believe that in these last days, God's going to raise up thousands of men and women, just like Smith Wigglesworth, who give themselves to nothing but the Word of God. And every time I've done this in the last, you know, since I was 19 years old, oh, God just shows up in such amazing, astounding ways. And I wasn't looking for God to show up. God would just show up and show off. I mean, visions, dreams, uh, Jesus appearing to me, uh, you know, and, and, and I, I want to read some of these. You know, I've, I've got six pages of scriptures of the importance of the word of God. You know, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing and asunder of soul and spirit and joints and marrow as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Now, when I quote scriptures, and I mean I have, God's allowed me to memorize thousands of scriptures. I, I don't do it to impress anybody. I do it because the Bible tells me to. You know, thy words were found, and I did eat them, and thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. My son, attend to my word, incline thy ear unto my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart, for they are life unto those that find them, and health to all their flesh. Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, you know, uh, nor sitteth in his seed of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in the season. His, his, um, uh, and his leaves will not li uh, wither, uh, and, and he shall both bear fruit in his old age. So scripture after scripture after scripture about the importance of God's word. Even the scripture says, I will worship towards thy holy temple and praise thy name for the loving kindness. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. 
Thou hast magnified heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Remember in Deuteronomy, God said he kept the people of Israel in the land, uh, 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 in that desert, dead, dry, dangerous place for 40 years to get one truth and one truth alone. That man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. So I, I want to write, I want to talk to you about some of my own personal experiences, incredible times of transformation that I experienced as I was giving myself to nothing, nothing, nothing but the word of God. Now I'm back in that place again, by the way. I, I, I've got great expectation. And, 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 and through the years, I'm sorry to say I did not stay within that place. But God did something for me within the last couple of weeks. And it's just a divine uh, uh, shift in my heart where uh, I'm 65 years old. And, I, and, and when I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. And I, I hope uh, that as I get ready to close here, that there will be a shift in your heart. That, that at the end of listening to this message, the Spirit of God would come upon you and you would finally just come to the place. I, I, know, I, I know a gentleman who's a street preacher up in Baltimore. He'll probably watch this. I mean, up in Boston, I think. And he has memorized many, many, many scriptures. And we spent some time some years ago together in prayer and fellowship. We hooked up through Facebook. And I told him, brother, I said, there's only one thing you lack, brother. What's that? He's, I said, you got to purge. you got to purify. you got to cleanse yourself from all the other useless, fake information. Um, you you got to have, you got to be singly eyed fixed on Jesus. And I said, you'll begin to see signs, wonders, and miracles like you never thought possible. I don't think he's done that yet. I hope he watches this video. I'll probably send it to him. He won't be offended. And brother, I'm telling you, it, it, you've had a lot of the Bible in your heart. But if you would just cut everything else, it's going to have to happen. The bride cannot be sanctified, cleansed, washed, purified, made uh, spotless and without blemish and without wrinkle, without this process. Jesus said, Father, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. He said, verily I say unto you, except you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. Whosoever eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me and I in him, and I will raise him up the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me and I in him. And even as the living Father lives in me, I will live in them, and, 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 and I, I, I will use you. I will make you one with me. So this, this is the key. I'm telling you, this is the key. Now, I went through those 10 major uh, aspects of Smith's life. And, and we do have these, need these principles, not formulas, these principles in our life. So God began to use me in amazing ways since I was born again when I'd give myself to nothing but the Bible. And I just want to read you some of these things I've gone through. I've had over 2,000 experiences. You know, liars go to hell. I'm not lying. And, and I have not written down every experience. I've gone over 2,000 experiences with God. You see, I've been healed for at least, of at least 20 major ailments and afflictions, and this without the use of doctors or medication. Um, healed of major allergies. Number two, healed of loss of the sense of smell. Three, healed of birth defects in the bones of my ears. Four, healed of a speech impediment where you could not understand what I said until I got baptized in the Holy Ghost speaking in tongues and God took away that speech impediment and I haven't shut up yet. Uh, number five, healed of a broken back when I was about 22 years old. Six, healed of a burned out vocal cords when I was 23. I was raised from the dead by my wife in 1981. Uh, I was healed of painful tumors in my abdomen around the same time. I was healed of a serious hernia that I had for almost three years until I finally got fed up with it. I put this building up in 1986, and I, I tore my stomach lining. And for almost three years, I kept shoving. Uh, I, mean, I had a hernia, and it got so bad it was going to get strangulated. And so I just began to shove it back up into my abdomen violently for a couple of weeks. And one night I went to bed, and when I got up in the morning, it was gone. Healed a dangerous attack of, uh, of, uh, of it's called conjunctitis. Your eyes turn red. Can't say the word. My eyes in the Philippines, um, it, it, I mean, can cause blindness. And God completely stripped it out of my eyes. Healed of arthritis in my 30s. Healed instantly of a broken foot 
when I slammed it down as hard as I could the seventh time, every time I slammed it down and it was a gift of faith, I said, I'm healed. I slammed it. I would uh, uh, black, red, black, green, blue. I'd fall down, get back up. My wife saw it the third time I was laying on the floor. My wife said, you're making me sick. And she walked away. And the fifth time I slammed my foot down, I'm telling you, it was instantly healed. All of the swelling was gone. It was completely healed. My son healed from rabies when they said there was no hope for him. I mean, God ripped the rabies out of my 16-year-old son, healed from prostate cancer, healed from a life-threatening colon cancer, which I had to fight for three months, Uh, healed instantly of a broken, twisted index finger, busted up, all black and blue, went to bed one night holding it, got up the next morning, and I prophesied, when I get up in the morning, my finger will be completely healed, and it was. My whole family saw it healed overnight of second-degree burns, healed of gushing red bright blood coming out of uh, me. Uh, Many healings on a daily basis. Now, I've had other visitations. Why, Pastor Mike? Because I was hiding the word of God in my heart. And I've been having dreams and visions lately, once again, as I hide God's word in my heart. Supernatural visitation when God took me to hell. And it's in my books. Angels took me to heaven. I uh, began to move in the gifts of the Spirit as a 19-year-old kid. Tongues, interpretation, word of knowledge, word of wisdom. Discerning the Spirit's gift of faith. Uh, miracles, healings. You know, the power gifts, revelation, revelation gifts, and the utterance gifts began to operate in me. Number four, Christ himself has appeared unto me at least six different occasions five visions and dreams so real that it literally felt like it was physically happening to me six divine protections to where a knife could not pierce my skin from a woman who was demon possessed trying to stab me to death i picked up a red hot frying pan but i'd have been meditating it was on fire and 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 picked it up with my bare hands my wife saw it and, and paul uh Waite saw it And I didn't realize it. I ran it outside, dipped it up for it wouldn't burn down the old parsonage I was in, which was like an old pine tree, and not one blister came on my hand. Uh, I've been in the middle of two gasoline fires where not one part of, not one hair of my body was burned or singed, and yet a person um, in, in both situations, the one my son, he saw it, he couldn't get to me. He couldn't get within 40 feet of that fire, and I'm in the middle of it, you understand? And another time, a man was outside of the fire about 30 feet, 20 feet, and he, he got burnt. Uh, Jesse Hafer, his right arm, I think it was, got burnt. I was shot with a 12-gauge shotgun by a gang leader outside of Chicago about 20 feet away from me, and I wasn't hurt. I flew my plane. I was flying a small Cessna, and uh, I can't go into the details, but the wind shifted. I couldn't land, and so I had to take off. My whole plane shifted, and all there was was high lines in front of me, and I ran into the high lines. Listen, the high lines were in the windshield. I mean, I knew I was going to die. All I could do is cry out to Jesus, but I'm telling you, my plane went through those wires. I'm telling you, the wires went through my plane, and I came out the other side without a scratch. <laughs> Uh, I seen a small handful of twenty dollars a couple years ago when we didn't have good attendance and uh, had a lot of bills, and I had a small hand of twenty dollars. And as I'm sitting there, I begin to count out hundred piles of twenty dollar bills, and it just kept going and kept going and kept going until I hit twenty two piles, twenty two hundred dollars out of a small hand. Uh, saw this building; it's a large building that can sit up to eight hundred. I saw God heat this whole building for two and a half months in the middle of winter and we had no money to buy fuel and our fuel tank was empty and every Sunday morning we'd walk out and take a look at the fuel tank that was empty and we would come here and praise and glorify God that another uh, week had gone by where God kept heating our building until the spring came. I built a $3 million facility, which I'm in right now, with only about 70 to 110 people in our church, and I didn't raise any money. Um, I saw a woman raised from the dead at Cracker Barrel. We were coming out of Cracker Barrel. There was a woman on the floor, a crowd of people, and when I looked at her, it was like compassion hit me. She was my mom in my heart, and I pushed my way through, and there was a nurse holding her hand, and she had no pulse, and I simply put my hand on her cold, dead face, and I whispered with tears in my eyes. I said, in the name of Jesus, I command you to live in the name of Jesus, and at that moment, the nurse got excited and said, she's got a pulse, she's got a pulse. The woman reached up her other hand, squeezed my hand. I knew I was done, so I just simply walked out as the ambulance came around the corner, Um, and, and so many cases where I saw people um, uh, that were on the bed of death, 
that were in comas, that had strokes, that they had no hope. Their brain, the one guy, he was dragged under a car for two, uh, 200 feet. And he died under the car. A girl was driving a vehicle, and she wasn't watching where she was going. She was texting about three years ago and dragged him under the car under, on the asphalt. And when they got to him, he was dead. They shocked him. Uh, Jason, he was only in his 30s. He came back to life, put him up in the hospital in, um, in York. And they told uh, mother, uh, he's gone. He, he, he'll never come out of this. He's in a coma. His brain is mush. And uh, when she called me up, the Lord told me, in three days, I'll raise him up. I didn't tell her that. I just knew that. And to make a long story short, I took one of my assistant pastors with me, associate pastors, and I told him, I said, now, when we go in there, don't look at his condition. God's going to raise him up. So we laid hands on Jason, and nothing happened. I didn't pray no long prayer. My prayer time, when I pray long time, is when I get along with God. And when I go out to lay hands or pray for people, uh, now's the time. And so I laid my hands on Jason. We prayed. No change. I left. Didn't hear nothing from the mother for three days. I wasn't worried. The Lord told me I'm raising him up. Three days later, I don't know why Patty waited. She called me all, all up excited. She said, Pastor Mike, the minute you guys walked out, he began to move and come out of the coma. And uh, they don't understand. The doctors don't understand. His brain is completely normal. And he came to our church and he testified twice. Just perfectly normal, even though his brain, had, he had been dragged underneath that car for 200 feet on the asphalt, and God raised him up. Now, I'm not trying to imply that I am some kind of great healer. I am some, no, no, I'm telling you the opposite. The reason why I wrote over 45 books on Smith Wigglesworth is because Smith was a man who did not get baptized in the Holy Ghost until he was 48 years old. But because the word of God and only and only and only the word of God was hit in his heart, that God could use him in a mighty way. So I just want to challenge you as I close this out. I'm going to pray that this, this hunger comes upon you. That you would decide in the name of Jesus that you would do what the apostles did. They gave themselves to nothing but the prayer and the word of God. I'm also going to encourage you, stop listening to all the ministers and preachers, all of these prophetic words dealing with the government, dealing with political situations, dealing with current events. Just turn it off and listen to the Bible and pray the Bible and speak the Bible and think the Bible and meditate on the Bible. And I'm telling you that the Holy Ghost the same Holy Ghost that got a hold of Smith Wigglesworth will get a hold of you and will radically change your life and use you for God's glory. Now, Father, I just pray that this message and all of those who were hungry enough to listen to the end, that you would take a hold of them radically and that they'll begin to be doers of the word and begin to apply the truths they have just heard. Lord, I pray you do a mighty work in Jesus' name. Amen.